Imagine a world where instead of suing Ford when your car breaks down, you would sue the car. It would show up in court with a lawyer to defend it. There would be a judge and a jury made up of fellow drivers. You would yell accusations at it. And when it was found guilty, it would be sacrificed to God. Welcome to Inanimate Object Court. Hi, I'm Dylan, and in my last video we talked about teen court and animal court, which are both totally things. And is it true that he threw pencils, pens, called you names? You should watch it, I promise you'll like it, and a bunch of you asked me to expand on inanimate object court, which is weirdly also a thing. Dating as far back as the 8th century BC in ancient Greece, Athenians held trials for inanimate objects, like rocks, and sticks, and trees, and arrows, and swords, and axes, and houses, and boats, and glaciers. Aristotle wrote in regards to this that when one does not know who committed the offense, he institutes proceedings against the unknown who did the deed. It was a way to have justice for people who might not otherwise get it. Also, they believe that murder and other crimes released evil spirits into the world, and only a fair trial could remove their moral pollution. So when there was no person left to try, they moved on to the object, the inanimate object. In the case of the glacier, it was put on trial for damaging the mountain valley, which is basically like putting the iceberg on trial for sinking the Titanic. During the 16th century in England, the Tudors were responsible for making inanimate object court as popular as ever. Everything from leaky rowboats to church bells that fell on people, which was a weirdly common occurrence back then, to swords were all brought before juries to decide whether or not the object had moved to the death of the deceased. Carts and wagons were also tried, and jurors often found that only one axle or wheel was guilty, rather than the entire cart. In 1535, a Nottinghamshire jury was faced with the death of Anthony Wilde, who was suffocated when a huge haystack fell on him. For this crime, the jury identified one small hay bale as solely responsible. These objects would be tried under the Diodin Law, literally translated as given to God. When an object was found guilty of murder, it was handed over to the king and then forfeited to God. This was not meant as a punishment for the owner of the object, but rather a punishment for the object itself, as its guilt is attached to the object, not the owner. And if you think this is just a wacky thing they did way back in olden days, you'd be wrong. Despite a literal train wreck of the Diodin Law in 1842 that led to its ultimate demise in England, the practice of assigning guilt to inanimate objects has survived in modern American common law as part of the law of forfeitures under the law of the Diodin. In 1974, in the United States, the Supreme Court upheld the law of the Diodin in the forfeiture of a vessel involved in piracy. Even though the owner was found innocent, the vessel was nonetheless seized and referred to by the Supreme Court as the offender. But it doesn't stop there. Without treading too much on the ground that we've already covered, in 1606, Guillaume Guillaume escaped custody in Chartres and left his sodomized dog to burn for having committed bestiality. The authorities, still wanting justice, did what they thought in earnest was the best. They nailed a painting of him to the gallows. Because... justice. Yeah! Hanging inanimate objects in place of absent criminals seems insane, but to follow the trend would actually become common practice, typically not for the living, but for the dead. Welcome to Corpse Court, where the justice is made up and the sentence doesn't matter. In the 15th century, if somebody died whilst awaiting trial, they would be brought before the judge and asked to appoint a lawyer. When they failed to do so, because they were dead, the judge would examine them to determine that yes, they were in fact deceased, and he would appoint a lawyer for them. The lawyer would attempt to prove the corpse's innocence, and if found guilty, the corpse would be executed. The corpse. The dead corpse. While likely dating back much earlier, the earliest recorded corpse trial was that of Pope Formosus in 897. The case was led by Formosus' successor and bitter rival, Pope Stephen VI, eight months after Formosus' death. They unsealed his vault at St. Peter's, dressed him up in Pope clothes, and brought him before the court. After a series of accusations laid on by Pope Stephen VI, at one point actually yelling at the eight-month-dead former Pope, Formosus was found guilty. He had three fingers cut off, was stripped naked, and then buried in the field, which was then promptly dug up by grave robbers who threw his corpse in a river. 
This is less relevant, but you deserve to know. A bunch of Rome's clerics weren't big fans of Pope Stephen VI, and they were huge supporters of the former deceased Pope. So they staged a coup and sent Stephen to prison, where he was strangled. Ten months later, after somehow stumbling across Formosus' body in the river, they dried him out, dressed him up again in Pope clothes, and put him back in his vault in St. Peter's. Happy ending. Corpse Court really took off after that, and the whole time there seemed to be very little question of its civility. In 1591, Judge Pierre Ayrot describes assigning guilt to the dead as no less pointless than posthumous exonerations of the innocent. Which totally makes sense. Until you remember, they brought the corpses into court. Lawyers would accuse them of things and recite evidence before them, and did I mention they brought dressed up dead bodies into a court of law. Around the same time in France, they went back to the painting. They decided that corpse court was still totally cool and morally okay, but it was silly to bring a physical corpse into the courtroom, so instead they brought a painting of the person. In 1670 in France, they passed a law that would make corpse court way more popular. Every duelist, suicide victim, traitor, and dead prisoner was liable for trial. Corpse court became so popular that families would dump their suicidal relatives into the streets to avoid disinheritance. Judges fought over the right to try the dead, and those who did laid out sentences that were meant to fit the crime. Deceased Hubert Potier, accused of murder and stealing, was sentenced to be dragged around town, face down, behind a cart, and then hung by his feet in the public square for 24 hours before being tossed in a cesspit. A literal shithole. By the 19th century, posthumous executions were fading into memory. One of the last was in Erfurt, Germany in 1806. The convict had been sentenced to death by breaking wheel, a fun little device that literally breaks your body until you die. But he killed himself to avoid it. The authorities, however, decided it would be best to carry out the punishment regardless, to deter others. This was met with a massive riot of over a thousand people, climaxing as the authorities attempted to hoist the broken body up onto a pole. While the formalized process of corpse court and posthumous executions may have died in the 19th century, the act of killing a dead body didn't. As recent as 1986 saw the corpse of General Gracia Jacques, a supporter of Haitian dictator Francois Duvalier, exhumed and beaten to death. We tend to romanticize the past. We look at the greats of yesteryear and ask ourselves, what's wrong with us that we don't have a Monet or a Shakespeare or an Aristotle or a Mozart? But we do. There are way more people now and thus way more people doing amazing things. You just grow up learning about the greats of the past. And yes, they are great. There are way more great people alive today that you just don't learn about. Humanity's knowledge doubles every single year. Look around you. We live in an amazing time filled with amazing people doing amazing things. Yes, we don't often treat those things or each other with enough respect, but we will get better. And we're certainly better than the people who had trials for witches and vampires and basilisks and had trials by combat. But that's a whole other video. No, today isn't perfect, but it's better than yesterday. We're getting better. Faster. That is, until we blow up the planet. What do you guys think? Is humanity getting better or are we completely screwed? And more lightheartedly, if you could put one inanimate object on trial, what would it be? Let me know in the comments. And if you want to learn more about anything that I talked about in this video, there's links in the description. If you haven't already, be sure to click right on my face to subscribe or at least think about it.